1976, people were dying out of hunger. Prior to 1976, you see T-shirts written Mao Zedong. Mao Zedong was the leader of China prior to 1976. He came up with something called the Cultural Revolution and the Proletarian Revolution, where basically it was more of intense socialism or command system, where the government owned all the factors of production. And therefore, as a farmer, you would farm, but the produce belonged to the larger people. And therefore, what that does, no one is motivated to work hard because you're not working for yourself. As human beings, you are not made to work for others. We are made to work for ourselves. So, proletarian revolution led to many Chinese millions dying out of hunger. Then, look at this. Mao Zedong departed in 1976. From 1976 to 1978, there was a cabal of four leaders who were jostling, including Mao Zedong's wife, on who to be Kuiv, a Mao Zedong. Then Deng Xiaoping took up the reins of power in China in 1978. What happened? Through deliberate policies. And the reason I'm giving this kind of analogy is for us to see what brains and decision making can actually do to the fortunes of countries. 1978, around 1980, Deng Xiaoping went to visit uh, other countries. Precisely, there is a time he actually also went to Singapore. He was surprised that people owned fridges, a fridge. Because China was so poor, out of 100 people, only four had fridges at that time. So he opened up the economy through deliberate decision making. Out of 1978, China's growth has been growing unprecedented out of decision making. It's not about oil, it's not about minerals, not about platinum or gold that they discovered. They discovered the main gold, which is the brain of a man. From 1978, China grew to the country we know today, which their GDP per capita is now six times that of Kenya. In 1980s, precisely 1990, manufacturing in China accounted for the global only 2%. Currently, 18% of the entire manufacturing of the world is by, done in China. In 2013, only three years to 2015, the amount of concrete that was used in China, building houses and roads, was the entire concrete that was poured in the U.S. for an entire century. But also in those policies, you have phones called iPhones. And you want to an iPhone, so I give them a look at Lakini hiyo iPhone in China. By 2020 or thereabout, now they are doing other things in terms of uh, divesting from China. But by 2020, before the decoupling done, being done by the other economists, 100% of iPhones were being assembled in China. So only the brand is US. So you want to iPhone, we to the that. If you look at the kind of things that helped China to grow, it was not about mineral resources, it was the minerals of the mind, decision making, and especially in tandem with the times. I also now want to give the last example, which they may not be far away from us in terms of GDP per capita and income per capita, but they are very great lessons I draw from Nigeria. Nigeria. Kenya may be ahead of Nigeria in many fronts, but I, there is one thing that we must borrow from Nigeria, not as Kenya, but as African countries. Lagos has the highest concentration of black people in the world. You know, the economy of Kenya, the economy of many of the African capitals, you realize, and we are now past that in terms of the politics, but I'm just giving it because it's a reality you realize it's not out of indigenous Africans. You realize they have a brother and sisters who are Kenyans, but may not necessarily be indigenous. 
how did it go? You hear of Kagote, you hear of sad billionaires out of Nigeria. Kagote started by being a trader, importing garments, importing sugar, importing cement. Then after importing, importing and trading, amassed some capital. After amassing this capital, they, he now started building the same things he was importing. He started to manufacture inside Nigeria food, for example, rice. You know, many people know Tagote because of cement. He is also one of the biggest farmers in Africa in terms of the farming and agricultural value chains. In Nigeria, there is another business person. You may go and research and go about them later. There is a company called BUA. BUA. For business uh, students, please. Um, because there is no time to amplify so many things, you can note and you can get more information later. BUA is owned by somebody called Absomad Labiu, a Nigerian also. Why am I mentioning these people? There is one misconception we usually have, Kenya and Africa. When we see rich people, we actually turn them into enemies of society. This should be honored going forward. Because out of the capital that got created out of trading, out of the capital created by Rabiu out of trading, themselves, they started manufacturing the same commodities in Nigeria. That does a lot of things, import substitution, this elevates the local currency, it gives more command in terms of the value chains and reliability within the internal domestic value chains. After that, they manufacture cement, they do food, they also meal flour, they also are in salt and others. Out of the capital created and the profit created, out of selling cement, the same two gentlemen, one is starting the biggest refinery in Africa, the other one is the second biggest, still in Nigeria. Now this is the point I want to make. Business people, Kenyans, economists, when a business person makes profit, who is, actual the own, who is the actual owner of that profit? Let me paraphrase. When a business person in Kisumu City, in Homabe Town, in Nairobi, in Mombasa, when that business person makes profit, whose profit is it? I don't want an answer, think about it. When Dakota makes profit out of trading, and then starts manufacturing cement, and then builds the biggest refinery in Africa. In essence, who is the actual owner of this profit made by Dakota? It is the people who get jobs out of the opportunities created by these profits. When you make profit as a business person, you can only eat too much. You can't sleep on two beds or five beds. You cannot drive five cars together. Even if you own private jets, you cannot fly inside two of them yourself. You can eat in Serena lunch, you go to Walsat for dinner, you go to Dubai for breakfast, but you can only eat and consume too much. The actual beneficiaries of the profits created by business people are the economists and the people in those economies. Congress power. And that is the kind of frame that we must start having. That we must start appreciating the business people of Kenya. Because out of that business person, if it was self-interest, they already have enough. The profits they make out of their mind. And one of the factors of production nowadays is actually entrepreneurship. That entrepreneurship spirit is a factor of production. Must be nurtured. Because the profits made out of these companies benefit the economy more than the owners of those businesses. Let me repeat again, citing a few examples. The profits made by Tesla in the US, the profits made by Samsung in South Korea, the profits made by CRBC in China, the profits made by Sunland in South Africa, the profits made by Atijarawafa Bank, the profit
profits made by Zenith Bank in Nigeria, that profit does not belong to the owners of the bank. It belongs actually to the economy because it capacitates the economy to employ more and necessitates more to become active agents of the economy. And therefore, I am dwelling on that more because for Kenya to change, the frame of mind has to change. For Africa to change, we must put weight and appreciation where it belongs. The real people who must be appreciated is actually not politicians. It is business people. They are creators of, of opportunities. They are multipliers of opportunities. As I wind up this technical issue, again for economists and all of us as Kenyans, just a few things which I believe, because a public lecture you share your thoughts. Some of the things that we must do on top of what I've just enumerated. Kenya, as I said, is growing at not a bad pace. 5.5% is not so bad. It's actually the 28th fastest growing economy in the world. But are there challenges? Many. Why? For a low level economy like Kenya, for us to grow at a level where every Kenyan is feeling the growth, we have to raise to the double digit. We have to accelerate our growth. We have to grow more. We have to grow faster. What should happen? Just a few things. Political scientists, historians who are here, if you start the countries, you realize three things are critical for a growth of any country. For a growth of a modern economy, Number one, we must have a strong state. A strong state based on merit, based on meritocracy. A strong state is important. Then, accountability must be there. And that is why we go to elections most of the time. Accountability is usually through democracy.